The Eternal Sonship of Christ, Chapter 10 The Necessity and Importance of the Doctrine But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? John 20, verse 31, and 1 John 5, 5. Certainly the concept of sonship is central to our faith. The Father's gift of love to this world is his only begotten Son, John 3, 16. God commands us to believe on the name of his Son, 1 John 3, 23. We must confess, we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God, John 6:69. 6, if a person is condemned, it is because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.18 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3.36 The person who has the Son has eternal life. 1 John 5 verses 11 and 12 With ceaseless thanksgiving, we can praise the Father for delivering us from the power of darkness and translating us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Colossians 1.13 All of the preceding pivotal statements revolve around the Sonship of Christ, and it is essential that our concept of His Sonship be in full harmony with God's revelation. What should our attitude be with regard to the denial of the doctrine of eternal Sonship? How critical is this issue? How important is this doctrine? How dangerous is the view which supposes that our Lord became the Son of God at some point in history? Should we consider those who hold such a view to be sound in the faith? Should we tolerate this view as orthodox? There are those today who do not consider the doctrine of eternal sonship to be an important issue. They say that if a person strongly believes in the deity of Christ, the pre-existence of Christ, and the triune Godhead, whether or not he believes in eternal sonship is a minor matter, a mere technicality or matter of terminology. They say that those who deny and those who affirm eternal sonship are both within the orthodox camp and should be considered sound in the faith. They argue, why does it really matter since we all agree that Jesus Christ is the Son of God both now and forevermore? Others have embraced the doctrine of eternal sonship and believe it to be a vital Bible doctrine that must not be compromised. During the past century, many in the Plymouth Brethren Assemblies have valiantly defended this doctrine and have broken fellowship over this issue as they deemed necessary. Many doctrinal statements of churches, Bible schools, and mission agencies declare that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God and the inclusion of this point and such documents indicates that this doctrine is considered important and an integral part of those things which are most surely believed among us. Luke 1.1 1, 1. Of historical interest is the case of Calvin and the intolerant Swiss reformers in the days when Servetus was burned at the stake for his heretical teaching regarding the Trinity. The controversy centered on his denial of the doctrine of eternal sonship. Quote, when Servetus heard of the unexpected sentence of death, he was horror-struck. The venerable old pharaoh visited him in the prison at seven in the morning and remained with him till the hour of his death. He tried to convince him of his error. Servetus asked him to quote a single scripture passage where Christ was called Son of God before his incarnation. Pharaoh could not satisfy him. End quote. Servetus was taken to the stake to be burned. The account continues. Quote, the flames soon reach him and consume his mortal frame in the 44th year of his fitful life. In the last moment he is heard to pray and smoke in agony with a loud voice, Jesus Christ, thou Son of the eternal God, have mercy upon me. This was at once a confession of his faith and of his error. He could not be induced, says Pharaoh, to confess that Jesus Christ was the eternal Son of God. End quote. It is one thing to condemn error, but quite another thing to put the offender to death. 
Obviously, we do not recommend the execution of those who deny the doctrine of eternal sonship. Some of these men we hold in high esteem. We appreciate their Bible-centered teaching in other areas and the contributions they have made by way of the pulpit and pen. At the same time, we dare not minimize the importance of sound doctrine as it relates to the person of God's Son. We must give our hearty amen to what the Spirit of God teaches us in the Word of God about the Son of God. God's people living in this present age have a definite responsibility with respect to false doctrine and erroneous teaching. God's truth must ever be jealously guarded. Our hearts need to be right and our teaching needs to be sound. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.16 See also Acts 20 verse 28 Our God-given responsibility to preserve doctrinal purity demands we take the following seven steps. 1. Test all things by the word of God. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 The inerrant word of God is the objective standard by which we are to test all things. In our day there are many winds of doctrine, Ephesians 4.14, and these must be examined and scrutinized according to God's perfect standard of truth. God's people need to be very discerning as they read books, listen to taped messages, hear radio broadcasts, and view religious television programs. We must ask ourselves how each teaching lines up with God's Word. Is the teaching truth that we can hold fast, or is it error that, we must, that must be rejected? May the blessed Spirit of God give us keen minds to discern between truth and error so that we do not embrace any opinion or viewpoint that is contrary to the mind of the Lord, even if such an opinion is voiced by a highly respected Bible teacher. 2. Indoctrinate God's people. Such was the ministry of the Apostle Paul. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Acts 20:27. 20, God's people need to be immersed in a program of total indoctrination. The devil himself knows the importance of indoctrination. The average Jehovah's Witness, for example, is ready always to give an answer to every man, him that asks a reason of the false hope that is within him. The average Bible believer is horribly ignorant of God's truth. Many believers would have difficulty proving from the scriptures even the basic truth that Jesus Christ is God. Many local churches function as evangelistic centers instead of edification centers. People are taught how to be saved, and for this we thank God, but believers are not being built up in the most holy faith. They are thus doctrinally illiterate and totally unprepared to evaluate properly a deviant doctrinal viewpoint such as the sonship by incarnation theory. The more we understand the truth about the person of Christ, the more we will be able to detect that which is false. One Bible teacher said that the best defense against the false teaching is a thoroughly biblical Christology. 3. Expose erroneous teaching. Paul did this repeatedly in his epistles. He exposed the false teaching of Hymenaeus and Philetus, who erred with respect to the resurrection. 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. When necessary, Paul would name names. Today we are sometimes told that our ministry should be positive and loving and we should not cause division in the body of Christ by pointing out doctrinal differences. Dr. John MacArthur, in dealing with the modern charismatic movement, spoke well to this issue. That kind of thinking sacrifices truth for the sake of a superficial peace. Such an attitude pervades the contemporary church. It is not unkind to analyze doctrinal differences in the light of Scripture. It is not necessarily facetious to voice disagreement with someone else's teaching. In fact, we have a moral imperative to examine what is proclaimed in Jesus' name and to expose and condemn false teaching and unbiblical behavior. The Apostle Paul felt it necessary at times to rebuke people by name in epistles meant to be read publicly. Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3, 1 Timothy 1, verse 20, and 2 Timothy 2, verse 17. We should expose those who hold an erroneous view regarding the person of God, the Holy Spirit. We must do the same with those who hold an erroneous view regarding the person of the Son. 4. Warn God's people. We dare not depreciate the importance 
of a warning ministry. God forbid that those who stand in the pulpits today should be timid sentinels. Again, Paul is our example. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. Acts 20, 31. Merely to teach God's people positive truth without giving warning is to fatten the sheep for the wolves who will not spare the flock. Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. Are believers immune to dangers? Are they safe from contamination by subtle errors? Is doctrinal defection an impossibility? Has the God of this age lost all control and influence over our minds? If these questions can be answered in the affirmative, then a ministry of warning is totally unnecessary. 5. Demand doctrinal integrity. If a church, mission agency, school, or organization has a doctrinal statement that is based on the clear teachings of the Bible, this document must be upheld by those in leadership. Honesty and integrity require that they believe just what they say they believe. Those who sign the doctrinal statement must do so only if they are in hearty agreement with the entire document. Membership must be denied to any who are not in hearty agreement with the statement of faith. Consistency and doctrinal integrity demand this. If the doctrinal statement does not accurately reflect the teaching of the Bible, the statement should be changed so that it is an accurate representation of those things which are most surely believed among us. Luke 1.1 1, 1. Not too many years ago, the director of a mission made it known that he no longer embraced the pre-tribulation rapture position. This change in his thinking put him in conflict with the doctrinal statement of the mission he directed. He could no longer be in wholehearted agreement with the statement of faith. The board of the mission had to make a decision. They could follow the wishes of the director and change the doctrinal statement to allow for his view on the rapture, or they could abide by their stated doctrinal position. They refused to change, and as a result, the director felt he had to resign. The director was wrong to abandon the biblical doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture, but he was right to remove himself from the mission since he could no longer sign the doctrinal statement. If a doctrinal statement says, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, how can a person sign the statement if he denies the eternal Sonship of Christ? To be consistent, a person should not sign such a doctrinal statement if he holds the Sonship by incarnation view. Inconsistency is serious, and the issue becomes even more serious when a person's published writing set forth a doctrine that contradicts the clear doctrinal statement of the organization of which he is a part. The doctrinal integrity of an organization is compromised when its leaders knowingly allow and tolerate deviant and contrary doctrines that contradict the clear wording of the official doctrinal position. In effect, such leaders are saying that the doctrinal statement does not really mean what it says. This approach is dangerous. It makes the doctrinal statement a meaningless document. Norman L. Geisler made the following keen observation. This is precisely how denominations go liberal, namely, when their doctrinal statements are stretched beyond their original meaning to accommodate new doctrinal deviations. We cannot allow this crucial doctrine of the bodily resurrection to be watered down by accommodating deviant views, no matter how much we personally like those who hold these positions. The simple truth is that brotherly charity should not be excused as an excuse to neglect doctrinal purity. Eternal vigilance is the price for orthodoxy. It is a sad day indeed when we allow the original meaning of our doctrines to be changed without ever permitting the church representatives to vote on it.